Welcome to the American Railroading Podcast, brought to you by the Revolution Rail Group, live from the great state of Texas. Join us as we educate, entertain, and explore the world of American railroading. Here's your host, industry veteran, Don Walsh. Well, hey, welcome everybody to the American Railroading Podcast. I am your host, Don Walsh, President and CEO of the Revolution Rail Group, the anchor sponsor for the American Railroading Podcast. We are a consulting and brokering firm in the railroad industry. So if you're in need of any kind of consulting, railroad related or brokering, whether it's rail car assets or other assets like repair shops, cleaning facilities, transload facilities, we can help. Feel free to reach out to us at 844-455-3434 or through our website at therevolutionrailgroup.com or info at therevolutionrailgroup.com. With that said, folks, we continue to just kick butt. I am absolutely shocked and so pleasantly surprised at the, the response we've gotten worldwide. We have been downloaded now in 18 countries, which is unbelievable, and no less than 29 different podcast platforms. I didn't even know there were 29 different <laughs> podcast platforms, uh, but apparently there are, and we have landed on them. So thank you so much for your love and support. We're glad that you like what you're hearing and seeing on the uh, American Roboting Podcast. And also, um, please continue to download, to share, and to leave us reviews. So reviews really help us out, um, especially if they're good ones. Uh, they really help us out because there's algorithms in the world of the interwebs, and uh, they pick up on reviews. So it really helps us a bunch. So whether you leave a review for us on our website at AmericanRailroading.net or on Apple Podcasts or what have you, it does help us a lot. So we would really appreciate that. We also appreciate those that have left us a little something on Buy Us a Cup of Coffee. We've talked about that in several episodes now uh, where you can actually basically leave us a tip. If you think we do a good job, you can go onto our website, AmericanRailroading.net. You look at the bottom left-hand corner, and there's a little yellow coffee cup. You can click on that coffee cup, and you can buy us one cup, three cups, five cups, or ten cups of coffee. Don't feel obligated, but you're more than welcome to do so. And then you become a part of our support team and become a part of our journey. So we really appreciate those of you that have and those of you that would like to moving forward. Going back a little bit to our previous podcast, episode four, with our uh guest Jimmy Rogers, president and CEO and founder of Boots for Troops here in Tomball, Texas. I want to remind you guys to please, please, please nominate your favorite U.S. Armed Forces veteran in the rail industry for a Honor Our Heroes gift package. And remember, it is free. It is free to you. It is free to the person that wins. We're taking nominations now and going through August 31st. And then we're going to draw the uh, the winner during our September episode. So, But folks, I just want to tell you a little bit about where we are right now, because we need your help, okay? As of today, we're a month in, we have a month to go. We have a grand total of zero nominations, folks. We can do better than that. I know that you're all patriots out there. You love our armed forces veterans. You know I do as well, of course. Um, please get those nominations in. Uh, and we've made the process a little easier. I talked to our friends at Boots for Troops today, at Lindsay and Jimmy Rogers, and they've made the process a little easier in case you thought it was too cumbersome. So I'll, I'll address all that at the end of the episode. Okay, so listen all the way to the end, and I'll go through the process. So whether you have a nominee that you want to enter in, uh, that's an American U.S. Armed Forces veteran in the rail industry. And let me explain that too real quick. They don't have to be a railroad employee. As long as they're in the rail industry, so they could be a rail car lessor, they could be a shipper, uh, they could be a logistics person, what have you, or they could be our guest if he's an armed forces veteran, right? So as long as their job is rail related, they qualify. So again, listen all the way to the end. We'll go through the process of how you can nominate someone. And if you would like to be nominated, we're going to talk about that as well, okay? Because we want you to, to be a part of this. Um, and as Boots for Troops said, if we get enough nominees, uh, we're going to have more than one gift package potentially. So please, please, please get the nominations in. Don't wait till the last minute. We only have, by the time this airs and you hear this or see this, we're only going to have about 30 days left. Please. So let's, uh, let's get our nominations in. And then also our merch is coming soon. I'm really excited about that. So uh, we're averaging over, gosh, I think it's 500, no, it's, it's 524 average downloads a month right now um, for what they call unique downloads, over a thousand total 
per month. It's it's a ton when you consider that the average download per episode for an average podcast is, I think, 30. Is that right, producer John? You can raise your thumb if I'm right. Yeah. So we are kicking butt there, too. So I know that you love America. You love American railroading. And now you can show your pride with American railroading merchandise. So that's coming out in August is the plan. That's my birthday month. Uh, not that I'm trying to plug my birthday. I'm just saying it is my birthday month. So we're, we're hoping to get the merch launched in, in August. And then also you may have heard at the end of our last episode that we're creating uh, challenge coins for American railroading. And so we're working with a group out of Dallas um, and they've got the, the original proof done now. And folks, I'm so excited. It looks amazing. I know you're going to love it. So if you're familiar with challenge coins, you're going to love these. If you're not familiar, go ahead and, and do a little research on them. They're really neat. The history behind them is really pretty cool. And we're doing it so that folks that are into railroading as well can have a little sense of pride and share them with one another as well. So we're really excited about that. So moving on to our subject for today, during the pandemic, um, the word supply chain, the term supply chain was really thrown around a lot. You know, it was used for a lot of explanations for why things were happening or why they weren't happening. But even as someone like myself who's in the industry and has been in the industry for over 26 years now, um, even I don't understand the entire supply chain process. So we've, our guest today certainly does, and we're going to get to him in just a moment. I'm really excited to have mine. He's a dear friend and uh, looking forward to having him explain a lot of this to us um, so that we can understand it better. But I wanted to take a moment and kind of tell you a funny story about my experience with a portion of supply chain. Uh, so as you may know or may not know, uh, rail obviously is a vital aspect of supply chain, but it also works hand in hand with other transportation such as cargo ships. And anyone that knows me knows that I don't just love rail, but I love water, anything water. I was a boat owner for many years. I lived in the Fox River in Illinois. I had a pontoon where I could literally walk across the street from my house, get on my boat and go. Um, anytime anybody offers me the opportunity to get on the water I'm in, you don't have to ask me twice. Uh, we have several lakes here in Houston and obviously the Gulf of Mexico. So any chance I get, I'm near the water, on the water. And so I was actually on Hilton Head Island several years ago. There is a conference called the Southeast Association of Rail Shippers or Sears. They were doing an event on Hilton Head Island. I've got friends on the island, my friends, uh, John and Heather, if you're listening, shout out to you. And they said, Hey, how about we go to Savannah for the day? That'd be a lot of fun. And it's about an hour drive. So that's how I figured we were going to get there. And they said, oh no, we've got a friend with a boat and we're going to take this boat trip from Hilton Head to Savannah. And I, I apologize that I don't remember the name of the body of water that connects through there, but um, it's also capable of, of um, carrying cargo ships, container ships. So it's a pretty significant body of water. And if you've never taken that trip by water before, I really want to suggest that to you. It is such a neat experience. There's a lot to see along the way, including Defusky Island. You can stop there. There's a, a place that uh, I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was called uh, Scrap Iron Ale, I believe, or Scrap Iron uh, Pub. Uh, gosh, I don't remember, to be honest, but it's it's Defusky Island. It's really neat. It's like a throwback in time when you land there. Uh, and there's also a um, uh, military, old military base. Gosh, it's got to be Civil War or something like that. It really reminded me of Fort Sumter, um, but you pass that along the way as well. So it's a neat trip, but along the trip, and remember we're on a 24 foot boat or so, right? It's not, it's, it was a beautiful boat, but it wasn't a ship by any means. And so as we're going along, we're just enjoying the day, beautiful sunshine, having a few laughs. And it's my friend, John, I, uh, Heather and the captain, Dave and his wife, and Dave looks back at us and says, everybody, hold on. And I wasn't paying attention. I look up and there is this massive cargo ship coming. Folks, it looks like a skyscraper on the water. It is absolutely enormous, especially compared to the size of the boat we were in. And it wasn't a small boat, but in comparison, it certainly was. And so what Dave was shouting out was look out for the wake, you know, and so the wake from this thing was ridiculous. And if you've ever driven a boat or, you know, done a jet ski or water ski, you know, you've got to position yourself in a particular way with a wake. Well, that's a normal wake, not a wake coming off of a massive container <laughs> ship. So it was like riding a roller coaster and it was just straight up, straight down, straight up, straight down again. And I felt like a bit of a ping pong ball, but you know what? It, it was, everyone was fine. It worked out just fine. Uh, but I'm telling you to be able to see that thing up close and personal like that, uh, was really quite an experience, but it didn't scare me off. I still love container ships. I got to experience, uh, several tours since then of ports. Ports play a very vital and important role in supply chains, particularly to rail. 
And uh, so that's where our guest comes in today. I actually met our guest at a Sears conference on Hilton Head Island, as a matter of fact, and we've been good friends ever since. Um, our guest for today is Denson White. Denson White is Chief Commercial Officer of APM Terminals. He is currently located thanks to his recent promotion. So congratulations again, my friend, on your promotion to CCO. Uh, he is located out of Pier 400 in the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, California. And let me tell you a little bit about his background. So Denson earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Logistics, Materials, and Supply Chain Management from Auburn University. He also earned his MBA of, in Information Technology and Finance from Auburn University. Prior to Denson's role as CCO, he served as BCO of sales at APM Terminal's location in the port of Mobile, Alabama, and I have been there, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I got the chance to get a tour thanks to Denson, and that was a really cool experience. Denson's role as Chief Commercial Officer includes a focus on supply chain optimization, which includes shipping, trucking, and rail continuous improvement, and customer relations. Since joining APM Terminals in 2014, Denson has literally traveled the world building customer relationships, significantly expanding the port of Mobile, Alabama, and has already begun hosting customer events in Los Angeles with names you'll recognize, such as NFL star quarterback Cam Newton and others. So he's already rubbing shoulders with the stars out there in Los Angeles. Prior to his time at APM Terminals, Denser, Denson, sorry, uh, I know who you are, <laughs> held leadership uh, positions with companies such as Standard Furniture, Plan for Demand, and Pactive with responsibilities that include overseeing uh, private trucking fleets, warehouse facilities, international freight, and domestic trucking, which provided him with opportunities to work with companies like Kohl's, Tasty Cake, Snapple, Ross Clothing, and Hefty, just to name a few. In his spare time, Denson loves to spend time with his wife and two daughters who are five years old and three years old, and they're big into swimming and skiing. Denson is also an avid skier. I can attest to that. I've seen all kinds of pictures of him enjoying the slopes, and he loves soccer without a doubt and experiencing the atmospheres of the game and its fans from all around the world. And as Denson travels the globe for work, he also likes to explore and experience the different parts of the globe while there. With that, Denson... I say welcome to the American Railroading Podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's uh, super excited to be a part of this. And also, congratulations. Uh, you know, whenever you're starting out a new venture or something like this, it just getting it off and off the ground is, is, is one thing, much less having a, a pretty big following right off the bat. So we're going to double those numbers. Uh, this is a good factor today. We're going to double the numbers because people are going to be interested in what we're talking about. Absolutely. And you speak it and it shall happen. I have no doubt about that. There you go. And so folks know Dents and I have been friends for many years. He's a dear friend of mine, originally meeting, as I said, at the Southeast Association Rail Shippers Conference on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, where we discovered that we both have a passion for craft beer. And uh, which we do, of course. And that's something I like to do when I travel is, is try different foods and things as I go. And also while at a conference in Charleston, South Carolina, we had a little bit of fun on a walking ghost tour uh, where, I got to see, uh, where I got to see a ghost dog, which was the first time I ever experienced that. So, hey, it's, it's, always, it's always so much fun to have a, a friend at these conferences and experience things. So I'm glad to have you aboard our podcast today. Is there anything else that I've missed that you'd like to share no, with us? No, I mean, it... it it, 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 this is a great opportunity, you know, as, as part of the international container shipping world, obviously moving things via intermodal rail is, is a key factor, right? Uh, and, and mixing this, it, it is, it's two different worlds, right? It's the rail world, it's the intermodal, it's the, uh, it, that mixes it. But here on the container shipping, you know, it brings almost every piece of transportation together when you're doing that. Obviously, we have a lot of truck traffic that comes in and out of our facility every day. And, uh, and then again, you know, almost, uh, you know, 40% of what comes in through the U.S. West Coast goes on rail inland to the hinterland via rail. So, uh, so it's very good combination here and just excited to be a part of this. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. And if you'd like to take just a moment and tell us a little bit about APM terminals, who are they? What are they about? Yes. Yeah, so APM terminals is one of the global, uh, terminal operators in the world. Uh, you know, we're one of the top three that just operate in, in numerous places. APM terminals has 70 terminals around the world. We're part of the AP Molar Merce Group. That's part of our name, APM, and that stands for AP Molar. So we're part of the AP Molar Merce Group uh, that's there, but we have every ocean line visiting our terminals consistently throughout the world. I'm coming from a place in Mobile, Alabama, where you were the only terminal operator in that port. So hence, everyone did come. 
come. Even here in Los Angeles, which is one of the largest ports in the world, we have basically every ocean line that calls this facility in some capacity uh, in our facility. All the majors, all the big alliances are here. Uh, so as a terminal operator, you know, our main focus is to get the ship in, service the ship, and get the product off the ship and into our customers' hands, uh, and vice versa with people that are exporting out of the U.S. to work with our customers in getting product from their facilities to the port and get it ready for operate, getting it out on the vessel and to its destination. So as a terminal operator, we're just in the middle of this. One of the items, though, that people talk about, we're kind of a black hole, right? Because you see the ocean line coming to your office. You go visit with the ocean line and talk to them about vessel operations and how to get my product from one end to the other. As a terminal operator, it's kind of a new concept for us to be kind of open and say, hey, customers, come here and look at this. Hey, why would you choose one terminal over another? In this port complex here, there's over 16 different terminal operation facilities here. So as a customer, as a BCO, as the people who choose which way I want my cargo to go, not only do you have a choice of choosing Ocean Line and who you want to service your customers, but you also have availability to service and choose based upon which terminal it comes into if uh, if all things are equal. So it's one of those nice things that we get to promote now and be a terminal operator out talking to customers and discussing some of the troubles that we've had over the past couple of years in the whole supply chain, trying to get rid of some of the myths that were out there, some of the pieces that maybe got in the media that looked visible to everybody. But then when you peel the onion back, you actually see what really happened in our world that uh, was, was a multiple factor piece, not only from the terminal, but from the railroad all the way to the customers receiving freight at the end of uh, at the end of the railroad. Yeah, and we'll get to that peeling back the onion here as we go, um, which I'm really looking forward to. So you clearly knew you wanted to be involved in supply chain early on, as, as far back as college, right? And you're one of the few people I know. And this is going to sound funny who've actually followed your college major uh, in right, your career, right? So what made you decide on a career path in supply chain? Yeah, I mean, I mean, everybody everybody goes into the business school when they're in college, and they either pick accounting or marketing, and then you find your way to more specifics there. And that's what happened with me. I was a marketing, uh, thinking that's going to be my world, and I had a professor that was uh, supply chain, and it all just made sense, right? It's the logical thinking. And for whatever reason, my brain must have worked that way because I was able to make uh, make A's on my test very easily, it felt like. But it was just the way that it, it was interesting, right? So if it's interesting, it puts you into it. And a great professor can also help along the way. So next thing you know, I'm in supply chain. And uh, first job out, I'm working with a, a group that's we're scheduling hundreds of domestic trucks a week out of large distribution centers with Pactiv, the people who make hefty products, and just continued on through that uh, path, right, of doing supply chain and working within this. And I found my way more to the international side, really starting with uh, some positions I had working on projects with like Ross Clothing Stores. We all know those around the U.S. as a major retailer bringing product into the U.S. and then distributing it and having major retail pieces. And then also working in furniture for uh, quite a few years, uh, you know, six years to be exact. I work with a major furniture importer and almost all of our furniture in the U.S. is imported from uh, somewhere around the world. And th that was really what got me, you know, rooted into the international side of things. Yeah. And we've been hearing the term supply chain an awful lot since the COVID lockdowns. Right. And there are multiple steps in supply chain processes, I can imagine. Right. Assuming that our audience doesn't know a whole lot about supply chain, can you take a moment to share with our audience what supply chain is? Yeah, you know, the, it's the inner working. You know, I, I still remember in the 90s, uh, you know, the word uh, logistics, supply chain, uh, and now blockchain uh, it could have been words that some people think are all the same thing, which they are very similar, right? Logistics is the overall thinking of the way that you want to logistically move your product from one end to the other. Uh, the supply chain is a little bit more of the linkages of exactly how you're doing that. So getting into the finite pushing of that. And now we even have the word blockchain, right? Blockchain is talking about the technologies that's behind it and then keeping that block of information fluent throughout the entire process. So all of these words can be synonymous to some people, but if you really get in the roots of it, they can mean a little bit of difference. But in reality, this is the way we move goods around the world. This is the way we move goods from one place to another and how companies 
do all of those things. And whenever you start talking about a true supply chain, uh, you know, let's think about an automotive manufacturer, automotive uh, a group that's assembling product. You have to start from raw materials being made into parts, parts then being made into components, and then those components being shipped to a place that then assembles all those pieces. And you're still not done, right? You have a finished car now that looks good, but you still got to get it to the marketplace. You still got to get it to the consumer's hands. So where does that chain continue on beyond that? So it all starts, one of my favorite pieces I like to talk about. I worked in worked in Mobile, Alabama at, at the port there for many years. Right across from us was a coal facility. So you had raw dust coal that was sitting there. Coal that was that was that was placed there would be shipped out, made into steel. Steel came back to that port in another capacity as steel slabs. That got rolled out to stainless steel. The stainless steel gets shipped back out of the port and made into stamped into parts. Those parts would then return back to the port, sit to Montgomery, Alabama, made into a Hyundai car. And then the Hyundai cars come right back to us and shipped out to whatever island or or Central America or wherever they need to be shipped out to, to then be sold. So one dust of coal that was sitting across our way passed in and out of that port multiple times. And there's your supply chain. That is amazing. And thank you for wrapping it up like that. That's a great way to try to understand it for folks. And intermodal rail cars are important to the U.S. supply chain. Uh, What may surprise some folks is that while intermodal rail cars only make up approximately 4% of the nation's fleet, according to the Union Pacific website at up.com, 48% of rail traffic is generally intermodal shipments. So for our listeners and viewers out there that aren't familiar, what does the term intermodal mean? Yeah, you know, you have a piece of equipment. And for us, the container uh, that that is is easily able to be transported is that the whole key to it is movement and movement fast. Keep it loaded, keep it moving and, and get it to point A to point B, C, D, E, F and to the final customer eventually and where it's going to be unloaded. And part of the intermodal process is getting the getting that container or any container. It could be a domestic container uh, and put it into an intermodal well car. Most of these well cars, anybody that's uh, in the railroading industry, you've seen these things before. You normally have double stacked uh, containers on there. Containers can be eight foot six or nine foot six in height. So you normally double stack those on one of these uh, intermodal well cars. And then it just goes like that. It just moves up and down the tracks like that. Even to the point now where, you know, you have some railroads that the refrigerated cargo, right? You have a lot of beef in the Midwest. You have a lot of uh, pork in the Midwest that needs to go back and forth and m- many other goods that need to be refrigerated where uh, where now they're making power packs. So one of the containers, whenever you're seeing that train pass by, you might see a white container that's labeled and looks like it has plugs on the outside. They're highlighting that they even have a container now that is a power pack. That is nothing but energy within there, and they can plug up 15 different uh, refrigerated containers to that, hook it all in the in the well cars, and intermodal travel, even the refrigerated cargo, own power uh, with one of the gensets there. So it's amazing what's going on these days in the intermodal world. That's amazing. And then, too, um, they can also be uh, more easily transported from ship to rail to truck, I believe, as well as part of an intermodal process, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. You don't have to touch the product, right? You go back to the 80s and before, where before the containerization was really in motion and everything went bulk, right? You took a you, you took a ship, you touched the product, you put it in a warehouse, you then touched the product, put it in a, a, a regular rail car. That rail car then gets to destination and you have to hand unload that. So you wind up with six, seven, eight touches of product. Uh, you know, you start talking about food commodities. Now you're getting into multiple crush factors whenever you're talking about, you know, grains and lentils and things like that, because you're just touching it, you're weighing it down. And the next thing you know, you have, you know, you continuously are degrading that product down to a poor quality. Now, when you're able to put it in a, in a container at origin, it goes in there. Yes, you might have some problems with uh, with a little bit of issue, but you're only touching it once until it gets to its final destination and unload it there. And then that that can go through, um, you know, a domestic truck to a railroad, railroad to a port, port to the vessel, 
vessel to another port, back on another railroad, and finally to a truck again. So you're getting multiple modes of transportation within this. Some some countries are even really good at doing barging, right? So that it goes from a main vessel to a smaller vessel sometimes to get transloaded to smaller ports, and then even further to a barge within that. So there's multiple ways of doing it. Of course, we care more about the railroad, so let's keep those things going. Here in the U.S., the railroad is the base way to go because going east to west, that the, the flow the flow of railroad is the way to do it, east to west. Most waterways in the U.S., while there are some tributaries that are shorter coming off the east coast, there's not a lot of water off the west coast that goes far inland. Almost everything runs north-south. Something like the Mississippi River is an opportunity for water travel, but really and truly in the U.S., that's the reason why we have so much rail traffic coming from the ports inland is just because the waterways aren't there in the U S to make this happen. Hence rail is our option. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you brought up about the quality of the product being affected by in the intermodal process, benefiting from the intermodal process. Cause I've only ever thought about it as an efficiency improvement, but that's an excellent yeah. point. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the whole piece. The fewer times you touch something, the less chance you have, of, of, of one of us, one of us humans screwing it up, right? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to bang into a pallet. We're going to knock over something. Uh, and then again, whenever you're just talking about product that, that's heavy, that's shipped more and a little bit in, in more bulk, uh, you know, you can, you can sack the product a little bit easier when it's in a container. So that's one option. But even whenever you just load it in bulk into a container, you might still get that four or 5% crush factor in the very bottom. And especially as it moves and shakes and does everything else. But you only get that one time when you're shipping it multiple times, you're moving it into different types of transportation by bulk. You wind up with that happening in, in numerous stances throughout the process. Hence, you wind up with uh, just loss of product and poor quality product, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great point. So I'll share a little bit of data that I think our listeners will find interesting about intermodal and, and freight railroading in general. So according to the Association of American Railroads at AAR.org, America's 21st century economy rides on the back of 21st century intermodal networks. Years in the making, this interconnected network of cargo ships, trains, and trucks has turned competitors into collaborative partners and benefited American consumers and businesses alike. This I found really interesting. So prior to the 1950s, each mode of transportation, and you touched on this a moment ago, had their own method of shipping which made transferring goods across modes of transportation complicated and expensive. In the 1950s, the Alaskan, Alaska Steamship Company helped solve the problem by building vessels capable of carrying multiple containers or big steel boxes of freight simultaneously. This pioneering concept of containerization soon evolved thanks in part to the leadership of shipping magnate Malcolm McLean, who established standardized shipping container dimensions. This important milestone paved the way for easy and affordable movement of freight across all three modes of transportation and sparked decades of intermodal growth. This container standardization allows for the cargo to be transported from, as we said, ship to rail to truck without having to unload or reload the cargo. In 2022, U.S. rail intermodal volume was at 13.5 million units, and intermodal accounted for approximately 27% of revenue for major U.S. railroads, more than any single rail traffic segment. It has been the fastest growing major rail traffic segment over the last 25 years. Around half of all rail intermodal volume consists of imports and exports, reflecting the vital role intermodal plays in international trade. So clearly intermodal traffic is extremely important to the U.S. economy, and it is international via imports and exports. Our ports, such as yours, play a very important role in the process with the arrival and departure of massive cargo ships and the efficient transfer of shipping containers from ship to rail, rail to ship, and then eventually to truck as well. So I'd like to give our listeners and viewers an idea of the scope of a port operation. You touched on it a moment ago, uh, I mean, I was fortunate enough for you to be kind enough to have me out to your facility in uh, the port of Mobile, Alabama last year. It's hard to believe it's been a year already. And right. that was such an eye opening experience for me because, um, I had no idea how efficiently you guys had that thing running. It was like, I, I do a lot of work with uh five S uh, lean, if you will, uh, process improvement stuff. And that's what it really reminded me of. Uh, it was right. a very well oiled machine where you had every 
area uh, categorized and such. Um, if you want to just take a moment and talk about what you did there, maybe even what you're doing uh, at the port in California, um, that to helps to improve the process uh, in your aspect of it. Yeah, you, you know, you, you, you're leaning into that. We didn't really talk about this ahead of time. The, the lean process, the, the 5 Sing, the, the whole piece of how you operate a lean manufacturing and you make that work. We've actually incorporated that into our business. We're not necessarily, you know, you, you a lot of times implement this into repair shops, mechanic shops. Uh, manufacturing assembly lines, right? That's the first place you look for because Toyota and, and Harley and some of those other ones, you know, they're the ones that perfected this, right? They're the ones that said, let's go. Well, these tools can be used anywhere. So one of the items that we've done as a facility has made that part of it to make sure that we're running efficiently. I mean, just like everything else, we're judged on productivity, right? Productivity of how fast you can move containers in and out of your facility and get them to the customer's hands because that's what the customers are judging you on. So you have that entire piece of it. So uh, good that you brought that up. And it's something that we take very seriously here. Even our CEO of our company, is uh, he, he's based in the entire process of lean and his entire thinking. So it, it trickles down to us. Um, but let's talk about ports, right? So, you know, and, and I'll even back out of just Mobile and, and LA. Uh, the ports in the U.S. Uh, are, are vital to getting product in and out. We're such a consumption market. But then we also do have these very large bulk products, you know, your foods, your grains, your things like that, that we're shipping back out to the world because we're so efficient at what we do here in the U.S. with creating those products that we didn't ship them back out to feed our partner nations out there in the world to make sure that that they're substantial enough, you know, with 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 food and with goods and with our raw materials that we do ship back out to make sure that those countries are able to um, properly survive and, and their governments are happy and, and, and it becomes this entire inner connection. And it's not just the consumption of goods. It's also the geopolitical piece of this that is also plays a humongous factor into who you're trading with, when you're trading with them, and then what those sanctions are. It's just unbelievable, the intertwinings of that. And part of this is the growth of certain parts of our of our nation, where the U.S. West Coast used to be the only way that you would come from Asia and bring product in because it was the fastest link. Also, with the Panama Canal expansion in 2016, 2017, that was completed, it allowed the larger vessels, so you can get the economies of scale, to now come in and flow from Asia into the U.S. East Coast and the U.S. Gulf. Hence, you've seen a major influence of Gulf and East Coast ports continue to grow. That is also part of now why you see the railroads seeing this continued growth uh, you know, with the intermodal cargo because you have a pipeline that's coming from the West Coast and that pipeline is only so wide. But now whenever you start adding in the other ports, the U.S. Gulf and the U.S. East Coast, that now can also consume those goods and push them into the hinterland and get them to our population hubs like a Dallas, like a Chicago, a St. Louis, a Kansas City, now those places that are landlocked can now access these goods at a fairly reasonable time frame and also cost, right? We alluded to this earlier where the number one factor of why you would put it on rail versus truck is because of cost, right? You can put a lot of a lot of containers, a lot of well cars together and move those to a city. And that's where you wind up seeing those efficiencies and that continued growth because we're really unlocking new pipelines uh, into the U.S., Places like Houston have quadrupled in size in the past 10 years. Mobile, Alabama wasn't even existent as a container port in 2008. It was one of the very last container ports, major container ports to get developed in the U.S. And here they opened up a major world-class facility, APM Terminals being the terminal operator there. And it grew and is now came from basically nothing in 2008 to being a top 20 uh, container port in the U.S., in just a couple of years. So how big is the average container ship and how many containers can it hold? Yeah, I mean, they're big, right? The biggest ones are upwards of 23, 24,000 TEU. A TEU is a 20 foot equivalent. Most of the time when you see them riding down the road, it's a 40 foot uh, container. So 20 foot is, is, is two of those, right? So whenever you get down to, uh, whenever you're talking about uh, the size of the ship, 
these big ships, 23, 24,000, will have around about 12 to 14,000 40 foot containers on it. An average one that kind of calls the US East Coast or US Gulf is probably around 10,000 to 12,000 TEU. Those are around 1,000 to 1,200 feet in length. Wow. So they're huge. <laughs> they're big. So they float, floating skyscrapers is what you call them, right? They're, yeah. they're just humongous. I think someone actually told me that the average, uh, well, when it's loaded, is something like 13 stories tall. Does that sound right to you? Oh, yeah, because a container in itself can be eight foot, eight and a half foot or nine, it's nine and nine and a half foot. So you can have on top deck, top deck upwards of 10 of those on there. That doesn't include what's in the bottom of the hole, right? So yeah, I mean, it, it can be, they can be big. And, and you just look at the cranes, right? Whenever you drive by anybody that's ever been by a port, the cranes are that high because that's how high the containers can be sacked off the water. Yeah. That's impressive. And so um, how many cargo ships would you say come and go from our ports since we're talking generally, uh, let's say in a month or however you want to quantify it, but I'm just trying to give our listeners an idea. Yeah, it, it's wild because because uh, this is even something that me in the industry and been in the industry for quite some time, it kind of blows your mind. You can go to some ports who service smaller vessels. So, you know, let's just go to a U.S. Gulf port. They're going to be dealing with a lot of smaller vessels that may be calling the Caribbean, maybe calling South America. So whenever they come into the port, they're smaller vessels in general. Uh, so they can come in and their port stay is only going to be hours or a day. So that's that. When you start talking about the bigger ships, they come into a port and they're actually going to service that port for four or five, some even six days to get fully unloaded and reloaded. So it really depends on the type of port that you are and the number of vessels that call. In LA, we're learning the largest facility. It's the largest single facility in the US. We only have five, five ships calling a week right now. And we're full. We're full, right? But then you go to a smaller port, you know, that a Mobile, Alabama, which is a much smaller port, is calling nine different vessels a week. And then someone like a Savannah, who's on the US East Coast, that is a very large port that has multiple vessels calling in and out of their facilities, but they call multiple ports uh, at a time. So they'll call Savannah, Charleston, New York, maybe even go back down to Miami and call multiple ports at a time. So their shorter port stays, they can have upwards of 40 vessels call their port in a single week. Wow. And then how long do the containers actually stay at the port before they're transitioned? Yeah, you know, this is where we get into this whole intermodal discussion, right? It's speed. We want to get the container in the facility, out of the facility, to the customer's hand, and either get the empty returned back to its origin where it can get reloaded for us to get more consumption product in the U.S. or for us to get it to an exporter, them filling up and get it over to the goods. So it's a very fast turn. Whenever product comes into the port, we want it to be here four days or less. Uh, so that's a very quick turn for getting in and out and get it in. For a rail dwell time, once you start getting dwell inside a port of three days, that's terrible, right? You want to get it in, have a one, two day dwell time before you get it on the rail car and moving into the hinterland. Wow. So it actually moves very quickly. And what types of items typically are shipped and received via intermodal? Yeah, I mean, it's now everything, right? It's absolutely everything. It really started out with retail goods. It started out with goods that you didn't want to touch multiple times, right? And, and that was it. Now it can be everything from grains, resins, uh, you know, you know, your your nasty scrap metal is even shipped in container now, which scrap metal used to be thrown on a ship and, and, and shipped that way. Now it's everything. Yeah. And I wouldn't have thought, especially scrap metal. So right. regarding the supply chain process for products coming to the U.S. from overseas to our ports via cargo ships, in a perfect world, what does the typical supply chain process look like from the time an intermodal uh, shipment arrives at the U.S. port to the time that it's loaded on a rail car, for instance? Yeah, we try to make it as quick as possible, right? I mean, our entire goal at a terminal is to get off ship and out of port as fast as possible. The railroads is something we can hopefully help control. Whenever we're in sync and things are moving at a, at a normal speed, we're in communication. The ocean line the terminal and the railroad are in constant communication with data flow of what's coming in, what needs to go out, what's that entire back and forth communication flow is there. Hence, before the vessel even shows up, the railroad knows how much car supply they need to bring into the port to service what's going to come off that vessel. So we want it to come off the vessel onto the well car 
in a one or two days, then out of the port and onward and making money for everyone, right? Making money for the consumer that needs the product to get it in their warehouse and to the consumer's hands uh, for the railroad to be moving those steel wheels, right? Don't make money unless those wheels are moving. And then for us, we don't want our ports to be congested like they were during the COVID time. We want the product off the vessel and we are the transportation piece that is moving it off that and getting it into either trucker's hands, a barge hands, or here in this case, a railroad's hands. And speaking of the pandemic, I want to touch on that next. So obviously the COVID-19 pandemic made a significant impact on the supply chain and perhaps exposed some areas needing improvement. So can you give us a breakdown of how, in your opinion, the pandemic itself negatively impacted supply chain performance? Um, A bit of a domino effect, I would think. Yeah, I mean, it, it, multiple factors. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm looking out a window beyond my uh, beyond my podcast viewfinder here that, you know, I'm looking out and uh, the president stood right out here and said, we will fix this. You know, he's pounding his, his fist on his, in his stand. We will fix this. We're going to make sure it's done right. And he's basically pointing at the container terminal as being the problem, right? Because the vessels were visible. They're visible. There's a hundred vessels waiting to be uh, serviced and brought into the port. And then you see the port and everybody's pointing at the port as being the problem. Well, when we got into the pandemic, it's multi-factor, right? Did we have a piece in it? Absolutely. Did the railroads have a piece in it? Absolutely. Really and truly though, people started complaining about things and talking about why they couldn't get their cargo. People could not get cargo in the Chicago hub because they said we were short on chassis. We did not have enough chassis supply. Well, We've had enough chassis for years and years before this. What happened to the chassis? The problem really came into, we had a labor issue, right? We had people sitting at home. We had people paid not to work. Um, we had we had warehouses that furloughed their people or totally laid them off. How long does it take to get an employee up to speed, right? To just get a key card, right? To get my badge and ID takes a day and they even know how to do this, right? So to get people back on boarded and into the facilities and back working was a problem, right? Because people were used to it. People had other means, right? People might have chosen a different profession. In, in total, right? They might have become professional podcasters. Who knows, right? To where now all of a sudden, I don't need to go back to my warehouse job. So now, where are the chassis? We don't have any chassis. Well, the reason why is because we have containers sitting on chassis, sitting outside facilities waiting to get unloaded. So now if we're not turning the product, now you don't have a chassis to go pick up the rail product. So now the railroads start filling up their facilities. Well, once that, that facility is full, New train comes in. We're saying, hey, customer, get your stuff. They're like, we don't have chassis. Well, why don't you have chassis? Because we're waiting to unload our product. Okay, now we just compounded the problem. Now the railroads have to go time out, time out, no more cargo into whatever area. And this would go on for three, four, five days at a time where they said no more inbound product. Well, if you're telling us we're the ones loading it, no more inbound product for five days. And I just said, we only keep product here for a max of two to three days. On, on That's what we want to do. But you're telling us to stop operations for five days. Where do we have to tell the ship to go? Can't come here yet. You got to sit outside and wait. So really and truly, you see, we're talking about supply chain. This was a chain of things that were going and multiple factored. And then you also have competing KPIs, right? We're all in business. And so we all have KPIs for our business. So now all of a sudden your competing KPIs was was for our normal times. Now all of a sudden you have problems where people are pointing the finger at each other saying it's your problem because I can't move the container. I can't move my train. My warehouse can't unload the product because I don't have a chassis. Well, all these factors start building on top of each other. And hence, we have the gridlock that we had. Really and truly, the thing that allowed us to get out from underneath that gridlock was our slight downturn in economy, right? We were running at 120, 130% for almost two years of consumption, right? And then when we actually cool back down to that, remember, we our economy never really cooled below our GDP, right? Our GDP is still here. We were so far above it that we cooled down about to where that was at, maybe slightly below it, but at least we got back to our normal stance. Hence now, starting like October last year, when we started getting back to normal, it's whenever the ports and the supply chain started getting back to some kind of normalcy. But our ordering process is still so far out of whack. Our forecasts are so out of whack that we still see problems today 
even in 2023 from something that started back in 2020. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you is, you know, what supply chain improvements have we made as an industry as a result of what we experienced then? Right. You know, we, we, we saw a lot of bottlenecks in a lot of different places that we need relief valves, right? We created this whole just in time, right? What do we hear in, in, in our logistics supply chain? It's all just in time, just in time, just in, well, but it's all just in time and you're not able to move those things in the time frame that you wanted to big problem, right? Big problem. It hits auto manufacturers whenever they are ready to start going back and start building cars again. They were missing major components because the just-in-time process had a kink in it, right? They didn't have certain parts and you can't build a car with a thousand parts and only have 990 of them, right? The 10 pieces you're missing is a major piece uh, that makes the car move, right? So hence, you need everything in, in, in that supply chain of goods to make this thing work. And, um, you know, what are the improvements, right? We start looking at different ways of ordering, different methods of making sure that it's a just-in-time process, but you also have a just-in-case scenario that's out there. Also, you know, people really have started investing in communication to where we're sharing the information. A lot of times, even in our industry, the ocean operator has their information, the terminal has our information, the railroad has their information, and then even the customer has theirs. Now that you start sharing that information up and down that supply chain, and is this blockchain, is it just a true sharing of information from one segment to the one that's right next to each other? All those things are big pieces. And this whole process of doing that has been a major factor in us getting out from underneath it and learning some things from it. Without a doubt. So in your opinion, are we where we need to be yet? Or do we still have a yeah, little ways you know, to go? This is always evolving, right? It's always going to be evolving. And do we ever find that perfect thing? No. And, you know, we're, we always have to adjust. Our world is changing. Modes are changing. Uh, people's preferences are changing, right? People are still scared to go back to railroads. We had some major customers, some big time names that have been sitting in our offices. And they're like, yeah, next year we might go back to railroad. What are you doing now? Well, we just take it all and transload it, put it in a truck and truck it out. We're not, we, you know, we, we we still like, but the railroads have been back to normal pretty much all this year. You look at the statistics and you have someone sitting in a seat somewhere that by feel, not even looking at statistics by feel goes, I don't like the way that that ran before. Right. So now, now how do you improve that? Because you do have major decision makers. They still make very emotional decisions. Right. So how do you predict those emotions? That's a major factor that we as humans uh, that have, right? And sometimes they're gut feelings, sometimes they're statistically driven, and you just put all that piece together. Um, and now you have to put that as part of your supply chain. Do you ever get perfect? No, because what is the perfect scenario? What's perfect for me might not be perfect for another uh, person, even in my same industry. I might replay, you even see this whenever you have new people that step into roles in any role, that they will have a different philosophy of how to get things done. Hence, is it ever going to be perfect? No, because everybody has their own opinion on what perfect is. Absolutely. And what can we do to help avoid this supply chain type of impact happening again? Yeah, you know, I mean, of course, we talked about how multifactored it was uh, just a few moments ago. Uh, and, and what do we do to to protect ourselves? And it's have the backup plans. It's discuss the backup plans with your teams. Um, you know, there are entire groups of supply chain uh, teams that focus mostly on rail. There's other groups that just choose not to use it as a factor at all. Hence, you don't even know how to, you know, what, once you get in a situation, you don't know where the relief valve is. So that's one of the items that, that we have specific to our container industry. Uh, you know, we look at things now and we're looking at the flow of cargo and we put a little bit more restrictions on uh, on things. In the past, like empty containers that would come back to the facility, we would just take them in, right? There was never a time that we said, time out, stop. You, you, we have got too much. And then hence, you would get the flood of containers in, but maybe we have a what we call a blank sailing. So normally every week a ship comes in, okay? So the ship arrives every single week, boom, boom, boom. It's like clockwork. But we know four, five, six weeks in advance, if an ocean line makes a decision to say, you know what? I'm not going to sell a ship during this week for whatever reason. Might be maintenance, might be lack of cargo, various reasons why. But we know that that ship's not coming. 
but we're still consuming in these empty containers or even export containers to go on a vessel that's not coming. One week, we can survive. What if that's two weeks? What if that's three out of six weeks? Then we're going to have these blank sailings, which can occur at times throughout the year. Point being is now we've learned that and know not to take in too much to our pipeline and communicate that out to the community and say, hey, coming up in three weeks, we are going to limit the amount of empties that are coming back to us because we don't want to flood ourselves with this cargo and grind it back to a halt. So we need to make a decision out there in the coming weeks. What do we do with these empties? We can't bring them in. (laughs) Who's going to hold on to them? Where are they going to stay? Who's going to absorb that cost? All those factors are something that we now actually look at, which we never did pre-pandemic. Yeah. And when we talk about ports, we often think about water. We think about the ocean, rivers, Great Lakes, et cetera. But we have what's called inland ports as well. So what is an inland port and what is their purpose or role in the supply chain? Yeah, you know, your audience is uh, is probably geeked out about this subject right here because it's, it, it's driven by rail. So an inland port, Uh, While most of the time you do think about an inland port as being something next to a water. So everybody would think barging something. But really and truly, an inland port in the U.S. is a rail-driven product. Um, Some people might know the word Greer, South Carolina. Greer, South Carolina was one of the first most successful ones that occurred like this. So Greer, South Carolina sits up in what used to be a very rural area. It's in a perfect spot, though, right on some interstates that run right between two major hubs of Atlanta and Charlotte, right? So you're in two major population centers, but you have this rural area that that might have been a forestry area at one point, a cotton area at one point, um, that, that had other industries that are going down. So here's someone, BMW comes in and puts a major assembly facility there in Greer, South Carolina. Hence, that drove a reason to put an inland port into this area because they needed to get the product off the ocean and into an inland spot. Well, the whole reason that a place like BMW chose this, they had available labor, they had available land, they had a workforce that was ready to go. And a lot of times in these rural areas, once that you get someone that's in a smaller town to go work for them in that area, you're going to have that employee for years, right? They're very loyal. It's not like some of your major cities where somebody's going to change jobs every year, right? They don't, there's no loyalty to the job anymore, right? But now here in a smaller town, you're very loyal to the people that are paying you and you're very proud of what you make. Hence, you're going to make a quality product and do all that. I bring all that up because now you look at where other inland ports are going to be made. Dillon, South Carolina is an area that was just in, a, in, a, in an area that also sees a depression of some of the old industries they used to be in, but now people are moving in there. I was in Mobile, Alabama. We're building the inland port in Montgomery, Alabama. Again, very close to that South Carolina mindset of where this port now is sitting next to a major auto manufacturer, Hyundai Motors uh, of America, and Hyundais are made right there. So you build your port right there because that's where the major flow of cargo is. So now you're taking trucks off the road and repurposing them for a port that's growing very fast to do more local traffic around the port area instead of driving a three and a half, four hour drive all the way up and you create the inland port for that area. And then you have total other areas like Chatsworth, Georgia, which is all the way up near Chattanooga, which is just a pain to get through a major metropolis, right? So you're solving a different issue. One, you're putting something near a Chattanooga town that's a very fast growing town. It's in an area that used to be a very big lumber and carpet area that had all these carpet manufacturers that are no longer employing people in those towns. The town infrastructure is there, but the job infrastructure is going away. Hence, you put the inland port in a place to where you have people, you have infrastructure, you have a good quality workforce. And then the next thing you know, you grow an inland port for your population is what Georgia Ports is doing, right? They're very focused in putting something in an area to where they know they have a population base and people don't have to move to an Atlanta, right? They don't have to move into the major city. You bring the jobs and you bring the manufacturing to where the people are. So uh, hopefully that's various levels of where the whys and, um, and, and you have those. They're just being built as specific points of getting product off the ocean into the, into, uh, into the U.S., and move it inland a very short distance, but there you go. Yeah, and that was a great explanation of that. Thank you so much. A lot of detail. 
People often ask me, and you brought this up several times now about rail being the most efficient way to move things. And people often ask me about the fuel efficiency of rail versus truck, as well as greenhouse gas emissions. That's very important to a lot of people right now. So here's some interesting data for the Association of American Railroads, again, at AAR.org, where it says that railroads are the most fuel efficient way to move freight over land, moving one ton of freight nearly 500 miles per gallon of fuel on average, which to me was really surprising. Freight railroads account for roughly 40% of U.S. long distance freight volume measured by ton miles, which is more than any other mode of transportation. However, they account for just point. 0.5 of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, according to EPA data, and just 1.7% of transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions. They go on to say that if 10% of freight shipped by the largest trucks were moved by rail instead, greenhouse gas emissions would fall by more than 20 million tons annually. That's the equivalent of removing 4 million cars from our highways or planting 300 million trees. Again, per the Association of American Railroads at AAR.org, according to the U.S. Federal Highway Administration, freight shipments are expected to increase by 30% by 2040. So in your opinion, what do we need to do to prepare for such a significant increase in freight movement? Yeah, I mean, and you're talking about the inland inland port side. This is part of it, right? Because you create a hub of a very short distance. And what do we all know as railroaders? The longer we can make that train move, the better off it is. So get it going and get it going a long distance. And we need to have as few points as possible. When you start talking about this as an option of what's going on, it, you know, there's a cost to taking a box, putting it on a well car, getting that well car, getting it where it's at, and then taking that box off. So hence, your short distances are very difficult to crack. This is where the inland ports become a valuable option because we're now creating a structure of getting things in and a different mindset of why to put it on the rail, right? The why is to get it off that very expensive port property and move it inland to where the population centers are and get it to where the people can then do the goods manufacturing. But it's an extension of the port. That's very important. Because most of the time, whenever you're talking about railroad hubs, so you're talking about major cities. When you're talking about an Atlanta, a Chicago, and we start thinking of all the places that us as railroaders think of where those rail yards are, they're usually not in cheap areas, right? They're in very expensive areas, right in the middle of cities. So it's not cheap to operate, right? It's not efficient to do that and get it necessarily in those hubs. And then whenever you start thinking about railroads and how do we move product, we also want to move it. And almost any time you talk to somebody, you go, if it's not over 400 miles, don't even talk to me. Most of the time, it's 500 and 600 miles to even load something and move it on a railroad because you do need that efficiency of moving it a, a distance to make this make sense, right? So you do have those barriers to the mindset of what we're doing. And it is also the speed of infrastructure. You don't necessarily have an intermodal yard because you now have to have the right equipment to move it. You have to have a gate to check it in and out. You have to have all the pieces involved to move product in and out and own and off a rail car to make this work. So now what we have to do as a U.S. uh, economy, it's the same thing that you have in some of the other items when it ties to railroads is how do you, where's your stop start points? How many times do I want to start and stop that rail car, those rail cars? And then what's my volume, right? Because whenever you're moving those rail cars, where you start talking about these volumes, when you start talking about these things, a lot of it is based on economies of scale, right? You're moving chlorine all the time around the U.S. because it's a needed product. It's heavy. It's dangerous. You don't want those on trucks. And it's just large quantity, right? And every city needs it. Well, not every city needs retail product delivered at a distribution center in their city, right? That's why you have major hubs of logistics like a Chicago, like a Memphis, like a Dallas. And then they distribute it out to us to consume. That becomes the factor is how do we get those large quantities in some of these smaller hubs to be that? This is where an inland port like a Who would have thought Greer, South Carolina would be a major facility to bring goods into? And here you go that it is. It's 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 a major hub on the East Coast. Right. Yeah. And providing an awful lot of jobs in the process, which is great. Right. Yeah. So believe it or not, 
we're near the end of our episode together Good. already. And uh, are there any other thoughts you'd like to share with our audience before we go? No, I mean, it's just, there. there's so many pieces to this, right? And we talked about a lot of different major factors. You know, we could probably make, uh, you know, uh, America Railroading Port Podcast that talks about the individual segments and we could probably spend 30 minutes on a many of the subjects that we talked about and really break them down. Uh, you know, and that's one of the neat things about this this world is there's so many factors to it. There's so many different people looking at it. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, what a, you know, a Lowe's and a Home Depot operate and they look exactly the same except for the colors on the outside of their buildings and they have the same products on the inside but their supply chains can be totally different because they have different philosophies and how to service the customer right and that's the concept that we have amongst many many of the different industries that are out there there's just different ways to do it different ways to skin the cat different places that you decide to hub your product and then to distribute it out to as, as goods so it's one of those really neat neat things. I'm glad that people took some time to listen to this. Hopefully some people learned some things. And uh, that was kind of the goal here. We stayed pretty high topic on most of it, but hopefully we got in the nuts and bolts of it enough to where people got something out of it. Absolutely. And I wanted to make sure I took a moment to thank uh, your team in Mobile last year for being so hospitable uh, with me when I came to visit. So if you're listening, folks out in Mobile, thank you so much for the time you took to show me around and explain a lot of the things to me. Denson, I thank you so much for joining us today on the American Railroading Podcast. Would you like to join us again at some time? Oh, I think I think we will be right. And I'm, I'm hooked already. Uh, this is this is a great service. You know, it's neat being in in uh, areas like this where you have podcasts and you have all the the junk that's out there that that you're not learning anything from. And here we are. We're actually trying to help people understand and peel back that onion. And hopefully, we did that today. I agree, and we're going to do a lot more of that together here in the future. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you again. And Perfect. folks. Yeah, absolutely. And folks, I want to take another moment, please, to just recognize our anchor sponsor, the Revolution Rail Group. Again, we are a consulting and brokering firm in the railroad industry. So if you are needing consulting in the railroad space and or brokering, buying, selling, leasing, subleasing of rail assets, please feel free to reach out to us. Again, our number is 844 844- Four five five three four three four, and our website is therevolutionrailgroup.com. Now, we talked about giving you some more details on being able to sub- submit your nomination for your favorite U.S. Armed Forces veteran for an Honor Our Heroes gift package. Again, it is free, folks. It is free to you. It is free to the recipient as well. Thanks to our friends at Boots for Troops. So if you'd like to nominate someone, again, they made the process a little more simple. So if you'd like to nominate someone, you can simply email Boots for Troops now at Info at boots the number four troops.com. Again, that's info at boots the number four troops.com. And be sure that you put in the, the subject line the American Railroading Podcast Honor Our Heroes nominee. Again, that's the American Railroading Podcast Honor Our Heroes nominee. Put that in the subject line of the email, and then you'll need the following information in the body of the email, which is the nominee's name, their branch of military, their rank their years served, medals and awards that they've received, a verification of service. Now, before we said the DD-214 specifically, but we're saying verification of service. We do need to verify that they served. And then just simply tell us why you feel that this hero should be honored. And uh, be sure that you you let us know um, what rail company they're currently working, working for or that they have retired from. And again, they don't have to be a railroad, just someone that worked in a rail-related field. Uh, so please get those nominations in again right now we have zero we have zero we can do better than that i know we can so patriots get together get your nominations in if you are a veteran and you would like to be nominated just get with a friend or family member and have them submit your name and have them submit your information and we would we would love to have you as a nominee Again, we'll be submit, uh, accepting nominations until August 31st, 2023, and then we'll be doing the drawing at the end of our September t- uh, 2023 episode. And we're really looking forward to having you all back with us again during our August episode, so stay tuned for that. You're going to love it. With that, I say God bless, make it a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us on the American Railroading Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover on a future episode or want to support or sponsor the show, please visit our website at AmericanRailroading.net. 